So now we move on to the next speaker, um, Rachel Foster. You're welcome up. And, and Rachel uh, did a PhD at Stony Brook in the United States in uh, 2004. You have been around. You've been to the Max Planck Institute of Marine Microbiology in Germany. And uh, some time ago, you arrived in Stockholm as a Wallenberg Academy Fellow. And you're still in Stockholm. And uh, you will give a presentation here on the pairing up in the plankton, evolution, ecology, and activity of cyanobacteria some symbiosis. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the Crawford Foundation and the um, Academy and, um, for the opportunity to be here. It's a great honor and pleasure to take part of the celebration of Penny and Prochlorococcus. And um, so unlike uh, Ramonas, I'm going to talk about populations that aren't so abundant comparatively. And um, as sort of my roadmap, I thought I would start by reviewing a little bit about these populations. Uh, these are, the first part of my talk is really about symbioses, uh, partnerships between two different plankton that are maybe one per liter, <laughs> two per liter on a good day. Um, and so I'm going to pay a little bit of tribute to those, um, review them to try to renew interest. I think these partnerships are rather <coughs> interesting from an evolutionary point of view and um, why I think they're useful to study. The second part, I'm going to talk about something that's more um, current research that I've been focusing on the last couple of years, these diatom and 2 fixing uh, cyanobacterial symbiosis. And then in the end, I want to kind of summarize and make a few p comments and come back to why we're here today, um, try to answer why or perhaps how microbes rule the world. Oh. Okay, I'm looking at, the, looking at Ramonis' computer there. <laughs> so, um, symbioses uh, are widespread. We have them in our guts, we have them in our mouths. Uh, they are in many different habitats. We often encounter them and perhaps we don't realize that we're seeing symbioses. And I've just highlighted a few here. <laughs> These are symbioses between multicellular organisms and uh, prokaryotic uh, bacteria, except for, I guess, oh, for lot, the uh, coral symbiosis with the dinoflagellate. But these are widespread, they're everywhere. Um, Symbiosis, uh, the underlying theme here is that cyanobacteria are one type of symbiont that have a high propensity to form relationships. And that started long ago. Cyanobacterial symbiosis were instrumental. There's only been two occasions of organelle evolution, and they've both been symbiotically mediated. The first was the mitochondria, the second was the chloroplast. And cyanobacteria were that early um, cell that was engulfed by that eukaryote that later became the chloroplast. And so these have been significant in our history of cellular life. And why I think when I look into the modern ocean, we can see many modern day analogs of these. And this is what inspired me during my PhD. I spent a lot of time at sea sitting next to my supervisor, uh, pulling individual of these different types of symbionts with a micropipette on a rocking ship, isolating them, and then studying both their phylogeny and their uh, ultrastructure using electron microscopy. So we see uh, a handful of dinoflagellates in two different families, dinophyseles, that take up these cyanobacterial symbionts in their girdle. We also have amphicillinia uh, dinoflagellates that take up eukaryotic and prokaryotic uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, we have uh, tintinids. Um, they're glowing yellow here is the blue excitation is exciting the chlorophyll of their cyanobacterial symbionts. We have silica flagellates. This was described uh, by Norris in the late 60s. This is associated with a Sinica cystis like cell. And then here, this is my tribute to Prochlorococcus. This is a spongios radiolarian that is exciting under green excitation because it's packed full of uh, what we found to be is Prochlorococcus symbionts. This is actually um, a tribute to what brought me into Penny Chisholm's office back in 2007 to tell her about my research that I had done. It's when I had a cup of tea and we talked about uh, the symbiosis. 
It's also special to me because it brought me to Sweden uh, in the early 2000s during my PhD to learn electron microscopy and immunocytochemistry on a Swedish stint grant to visit Stockholm University, which is where I work now, which also funded, uh, sponsored my application for the Valenberry Fellow. So this research is sort of a, a, a walk in my, in my academic history here. So we're looking at, uh, just to explain here, we have uh, two different types of spongios radiolaria. This is blue excitation, exciting the cyanobacteria. We have green excitation, exciting also the cyanobacteria, the phycobilly proteins. In the middle here is a really ugly tree, but lots of different colors. These are, I looked at a variety of different eukaryotes that take up cyanobacterial symbionts. I isolated them, did an RT step to increase the template, because we're doing single cell uh, PCR. We didn't do any amplification, uh, like whole genome amplification. We just wanted to increase uh, the 16S gene. And then we used a small fragment. And right up here is actually this. This is the actual cell before it went into the PCR tube. And this is its 16S sequence. So it, it clustered with the Plochlorococcus low BA clade. In parallel, there were samples that were fixed and then um, processed with immunocytochemistry using antibodies raised against phycoerythrin and nitrogenase, and that's what you see over here. So we had a couple different um, cell types that were associated with these uh, radiolaria. We also saw that their ultrastructure, their cell size, they localized... Okay. They localized uh, the phycoerythrin on their peripheral thylakoids, which is an ultrastructure character class, um, that we see in Prochlorococcus. Uh, they did not localize nitrogenase, as we would expect. Uh, so that's my tribute to Prochlorococcus. Uh, since then, I don't think anyone has looked at this, so it's a, an, an unexplored mystery for you, Penny. You can carry on with this one, perhaps. Add it to your list. Um, now, in, in terrestrial examples, uh, cyanobacterial symbiosis, and we're going to hear about this in the next talk by Professor Martin, um, we see a lot of modifications to hold their symbionts. So in those cases, the, there's many cyanobacterial symbiosis, and they're held in special chambers. We don't really see these types of morphological adaptations in the plankton, uh, with the exception, I'd say, these beautiful dinoflagellates that take up their cyanobacterial symbionts by invaginating the skirtle. You can imagine that a couple million years, maybe these will become, they'll keep this cyanobacteria as their chloroplast. So these the group of dinoflagellates have lost their photosynthetic ability, and instead they perhaps rely on these cyanobacteria. So everything I've been saying now about these associations, it's all presumed that these are photosymbiosis. It's never been documented what the function of either partner is. It's just presumed based on the physiology of the symbiont. We also have threesomes in the plankton. So we have these diatoms that take up, uh, that, that associate also with a, a proteist, and then these also take up a cyanobacteria. So these are cosmopolitan uh, di diatoms, widely distributed, again, only been studied by microscopy. And it's presumed that the symbiont, uh, that the, perhaps the synecococcus is providing carbon or nitrogen, and the proteist is uh, providing some sort of motility. And the diatoms are often devoid of any sort of cell content, so they're just providing house. Again, we, we really don't know much about them other than our observations. This is some beautiful work done by a Swedish researcher, Hanna Farnolid. Um, she studied also these dinoflagellates that take up symbionts, but she was uh, characterizing not just the cyanobacterial symbionts, but she characterized the heterotrophic bacteria that also associated with the diatoms and the girdle. So these were also three-part symbiosis. And these... Um, she was one of the only people who have used a functional gene applied to these symbioses to try to understand uh, the potential function that perhaps these heterotrophic bacteria were providing nitrogen to the host. Again, this is just presumed. It's, it's not known. On the far side of the slide here, I'm also showing uh, this um, lorica of this uh, tintinid, codinella, and it's also associating with cyanobacteria and bacteria. So you see a three-part symbiosis. And we can also observe that some of the populations of cyanobacteria were also in the process of cell division when we collected them. 
suggesting, and that opens up an also a complete unknown in all of these planktonic symbiosis, even the, second, the other sets that I'll talk about. How do these two different partners coordinate their growth cycles? We know nothing about that. So uh, there are also populations that are a bit more well studied or more interesting because these are largely mediating the nitrogen cycle. So we have two different systems of N2 fixing planktonic symbiosis. We have diatoms that associate with heterocystis cyanobacteria, and then we also have a prosimniophyte, a single cell eukaryotic algae as well, that associates with this unusual uh, cyanobacteria called UCNA. We know that these are widely distributed by using qPCR assays, and in this case, we can use microscopy. We are, they're considered major N2 fixers. We find uh, we can measure high activity and when these organisms are present. But one of the biggest challenges is that, that neither either one of these systems can be maintained in, in long-term culture. And so we're really at the mercy of going out on field expeditions. But recently, we uh, in my group have developed some new tools to try to understand more about these populations by using some information in their genome. Both systems have eroded genomes, so you can see that up here, the different size of genomes for each of the particular symbionts. Um, I forgot to mention, so the yellow here, this is the cyanobacterial symbionts, the red is the chloroplast of the host. Uh, here's the other symbiont and uh, catoceris. They, uh, the, uh, Colothrix that associates with Catoceris, uh, and this is using cardfish to highlight the cyanobacteria. Now, in both these systems, they've lost, they have eroded genomes, especially for this particular endobiont, but uh, they're very different pathways. So, USNA has completely lost its ability to photosynthesize, uh, whereas in some of these endobionts, they've lost. Uh, different ways to pick up, take up different nutrients, uh, such as nitrate or nitrate reductases, ammonia transporters. So they're really just N2 fixing cells. The location varies in these distant systems, and this is going to be important for the second part of my talk. So we can see that it's presumed that this location of the Rickelia that associates with Hemialis is the same as it is in the Rhizoslenia, where the symbiont environment is actually between the glass house of the diatom and the plasma lemma or the, the of, of, the, of the host cell. And in the catoceris, it's actually attached to the outside at the size of its uh, heterocyst. Uh, it's um, unknown um, or controversial in the USNA symbiosis. But this location is uh, reflected. We know that the more internal the symbiont is, the smaller the genome and the more gene loss that it has. And it's presumed that that would be an increase in dependency. So in symbiotic research, if you're a symbiont, you start to lose more genes that are redundant with your host, you become more dependent on your uh, host system. So you have become more obligate. And finally, um, we know that in these systems, at least for USNA, that carbon is fixed by its host and transferred to its symbiont. And we know that nitrogen is fixed by USNA and transferred to the host. And we did that work by using stable isotopes and nanosims, <laughs> a way to look at the isotopic distribution of that labeled substrate in the two different partners. And knowing that USNA could not fix uh, carbon on its own, the only way that carbon got into its cell was from its host. Uh, in this, the diatom diazotroph associations, we only know that we measured carbon fixation in the presence of these blooms, and we have used nanosims to show that nitrogen is fixed and transferred. But we don't know the role of carbon, for example, or which we know both organisms are capable of photosynthesis. So this leads me to the second part of my talk, where I'm going to focus on these diatom diazotroph associations. And I'm going to ask a few different, show some results for a few different questions. So we want to look at how integrated these partners are. We want to resolve that cellular location because that's really going to dictate the environment that that symbiont is. If it's more internal, its environment is going to look a lot different than it's living on the outside of the cell. And that's going to uh, motivate us to understand more about how, which one of these partners is actually fixing carbon. So uh, perhaps it's carbon or CO2 and bicarbonate transport is going to be reflective of where it's located. And then finally, I, I want to show a little new side project we have, which I'm playing, making a play on words here, DDAs in a Tara Haystack experiment. Uh, so that's a, a teaser, so you have to stay listening. 
So um, my recently graduated PhD student, Andrea, was uh, interested in resolving this question of location. So he was also a keen microscopist, so we took an, uh, I have an archive of many uh, fixed cells from many different cruises. So he looked at um, about 240 cells. He used confocal microscopy in the natural autofluorescence of the symbiont to just resolve what's the three-dimensional location of the symbiont inside its host. And uh, this is the raw image, this is the process image, and this is using these different projections in three different planes to try to resolve where the symbiont is. And he noticed in his observations that a majority of the time, the chloroplast uh, autofluorescence was surrounding, if not um, all-encompassing, the symbiont trigome, which is the, the orange here. You can make movies of these things, and we have many of them. This is just highlighting the green, again, is the chloroplast of the diatom, and the orange is the, the autofluorescence of the symbiont. He also did DAPI staining, and he could see that the, the Rucalia trichome was here located close to the nucleus. So this is the processed image, and this is the raw image, suggesting that it was perhaps penetrating partially, if not inside the symbiont, inside the host cell. Now, um, my first experience with nanosims was really, I wanted to use this method, it's commonly used sometimes to, to make single cell measurements. So you can feed a cell a labeled substrate, and if it's incorporated in the cell over a period of time, you can then trace the cellular location of that. And you can quantify the ratio of that. So we, so we took this cell here, this is a hemialis chain, and I've drawn some outlines here. We've given it some 15 labeled N2, here's the symbiont, Here's the symbiont. The nitrogen goes in, it's reduced, and then some of that nitrogen is passed to the host cell. And we can circle areas and we can quantify the isotopic ratio. So it's a way to demonstrate fixation and transfer and quantify that as well and visualize it. So it's fantastic, right? But what about carbon? Um, and I show up here, I lost an arrow here, but this is the process of nitrogen fixation. Highlighted takes a lot of ATP. In, plankton, in symbiotic systems on land, the host is a, one of the primary sources of the energy for that. We don't know what's going on in terms of these planktonic symbiosis. We have two photosynthetic organisms. We have the draft genome of the symbionts, showing that they have the full suite of uh, genetic repertoire to fix carbon and to store carbon, and, uh, but we don't know if, in fact, both partners are fixing carbon. So that's the great unknown. So we don't have them in culture. How can we figure this out? Well, we go out to sea, we collect some field populations, and we run that same experiment where we've taken 15 N2 and 13 labeled bicarbonate, and we incubate the cells. So here's the cell before we put it into the nanosims instrument. Uh, we're going to look at this cell. It's a chain. Uh, this is the total ion content image, so that's all the secondary ions that the, the mass spectrometer is measuring. We see colorimetrically a high enrichment of nitrogen and a high enrichment of carbon. That's what we expect. These are happy, healthy hemialis membranaceous cells. But what if we treat one of our bottles with a cyclohexamide? So this is a eukaryotic protein translation inhibitor. So we don't want to kill the host, but we just want to sort of slow it down, turn it off, don't let it communicate to its symbiont. What happens now? So here we're looking at this cell again. Arrows are designating where that symbiont is. We see that nitrogen is localized just where that symbiont is, right? And the carbon is less than for sure than the host cell. So a little bit of evidence that something different is happening when the host is turned off. Perhaps you like to look at ratios instead of just nanosims pictures. So here's the enrichment of carbon, and here's the enrichment of nitrogen. Here are our control cells, uh, either the diatom or the black and the green or the rickelia, and here's the treated cells. So we can c circle regions of interest and we can quantify the ratio. If the cells were dead and inactive, they would be down here by natural abundance. But we can see gr that there's a severe increase in activity in the control cells uh, compared to the treated cells, suggesting that maybe the host is necessary or perhaps the host is the one fixing most of the carbon and driving the nitrogen fixation and driving the activity of the symbiont. Now I want to give you a crash course in diatom CCM. So the, <laughs> the Rubisco enzyme of diatoms is, uh, or Rubisco enzyme in general, is highly inefficient. And this is a, a model based on the model diatom phaeodactylum tricarnutum, and it's how they fuel their, bring the carbon into their diatoms, uh, to the Rubisco that's housed over here in the chloroplast and the pyrenoid. 
And it's thought that by using, and I've, you also see the concentrations of these different elements. So that's going to be important in the next step here. So the chloroplast pump is going to pump bicarbonate into the cell. And that pumping is going to increase the concentration. It's going to drive a, um, a concentration gradient of CO2 into the cell. Now imagine, and the carbonic anhydrases here, these are going to um, interconvert the CO2 and the bicarbonate. So we've got active transport in and passive diffusion driven by a concentration gradient. And that's the model. Imagine you're a symbiont, right? So the, remember, I was fascinated by location. So if you're outside here, how are you going to transport your bicarbonate or your CO2 to fix your carbon? Versus if you're located here, your rhizoselenia or symbiosis, and you're hanging out between the frustral and the plasma membrane, what's your concentration of bicarbonate relative to the outside of the cell? Relative to that rickelia, that's really internal, right? So it's different. Their experience, their environment isn't the outside ocean, it's inside this host diatom cell, which has a very different carbon, uh, rep, uh, bicarbonate and carbon CO2 at, um, environment. Now let's go to the genome and see what do they have inside their genome to reduce carbon or to, uh, to transport that bicarbonate. And this is the work done by uh, my postdoc, Mercedes Morion. And this is in collaboration with a fantastic cell, cyanobacterial cell biologist who, um, Mercedes comes from his lab and joined, my, joined me as a postdoc, where we're trying to understand um, by using uh, different sets of techniques to, we don't have these systems in culture, but perhaps we can take their genes and put them into model cyanobacterial systems using co genetic complementation approaches. And one gene of interest that we found is this BIC-A gene. This is a, um, an important gene for bringing, a, that's been shown in cyanobacteria to transport bicarbonate. We have found it in the most internal genome, but it's in the most internal symbiont, but it's extremely reduced. It's been, chopped, it's been uh, in fragments, and we find it in the external one. So we take the, the gene here, we synthesize it, and then we put it into a synecococcus strain that we know doesn't have the BIC-A, but it has other means to bring bicarbonate in. So that's our wild type here. Uh, we also have a control cell, control cell line, which is just to see the effect of putting a plasmid in, because we're going to put our Rickelia rint genes, our BIC-A genes, into a plasmid, and we're going to put that plasmid into the synecococcus PCC7942. And then we're going to incubate them with 14C in a, a very fast sort of pulse chase experiment to see how quickly is that BIC-A functional. So we see the wild type outperforms the control, but it also outperforms our... Uh, our wild type that has our uh, symbiont genes in it. So given these conditions, we would maybe presume that that BIC-A is non-functional. So we're continuing that work under different sets of conditions, optimizing, trying other different pHs and whatnot. But we've also been thinking about alternative carbon sources to fuel the nitrogen fixation. And so we've been looking at potentially if the host is providing the sugars, We've identified certain transporters for those sugars, and we've also inver identified an in inver invertase B, which is uh, used in the cyanobacteria in the Anabena 7120, a model organism. It's required for diazotrophic growth. So we're also using a mutant strain, and we're putting in its rint the, the symbiont genes in that to test its functionality. So even if we don't have these cells in culture, we can start to learn more about their physiology by turning to these model systems where mutants exist, where cell lines exist that can take up our foreign DNA. So it's an exciting new approach. Um, not very common, I say, in our, in our field currently, but we are starting to learn more about these different symbiotic systems by turning to these other models. So now this uh, quickly would like to go through my DNA, my DDA in a Terra Haystack project. So this has been a new collaboration uh, with Chris Bowler and his postdoc Juan Perella Carliche in, in, from Paris, France. And this is the Terra Oceans project, which I'm surprised no one has um, talked about in too much detail so far. But this was an expedition, for those of you not familiar, that took place in 2009 to, uh, to 2013. 
210 stations were sampled, 40,000 samples, um, mostly from the surface, the, DC, the deep chlorophyll maximum, and the mesopelagic. We hear so much about this project from the point of DNA and RNA sequencing, but we haven't heard so much about microscopy. So at each of these stations, there were also multiple microscopy samples that were collected. And what really inspired me to jump on and into this collaboration was the complete and utter frustration I've experienced for the last several years since the Terra data has been released. And I recently have just found out that the Marine Atlas of Terra Ocean Unigenes, so this is the gene database that I would potentially find these symbiosis in, I've recently found out that those catalog of genes have been assembled based on poly A tail reads. So I'm studying a prokaryotic organism and they are not going to be selected by this sort of technical step. So it has given me great relief to understand why I can never find my symbioses in these uh, different, in these larger size fractions, but also gives me great frustration knowing that now the only way to find them is to go back to the raw reads rather than the assembled reads. But we move on because we have been able to uh, look into the tar tar microscopy samples a little bit. So we're going to tap into an existing sort of pipeline that they have. So this work was led by Sebastian Colleen, a former uh, co-author of mine on a book chapter, uh, where they took the samples that were collected during Tara. They were fixed out at sea. They were collected by a plankton net. They were then prepared for an automated uh, confocal microscopy. Um, and these images were digitized and they went into an archive. And then they made a model that could basically predict a certain group of organisms, diatoms, dinoflagellates, for example. And they discovered many different, um, some new, new symbiosis and whatnot, but they weren't particularly uh, focused on the DDAs. So where do we, we want to look into some of those confocal samples, but we first need to know where to start. So what you're looking at here is uh, we took some of the raw reads from the 20 to 180 micron size fraction, and we made our own select database based on a cytochrome B6 uh, gene for Rickelia and the NIFH gene, which is for nitrogenase. And these are all the different Terra samples in the size fraction. Here are the different oceans. And we also use the 18S metabar coding uh, to try to pull out hemialis, the host. We had that gene. Uh, and where we saw matches between the hemialis and perhaps these genes for Rickelia, we went to those stations and we went to those microscopy samples and we said, okay, let's take a finer look and, and see what the images look like. And in particular, we found a couple locations uh, here is Station 142. Station Aloha was a great spot to find the Rhizocene and Rickelia symbiosis in the microscopy images. And then we also found Catoceris uh, colothric symbiosis off here in the Indian Ocean. And so what do these look like? Here's the microscopy uh, samples from the Ecotox. So these are the Terra Ocean microscopy samples using confocal microscopy and a couple different stains. These were the images that we were using to train the model to predict our symbiosis in the great archive of images. Here's the Catoceris one. So we have the symbionts hanging out on the outside of the Catoceris. Each one of these images comes with a variety of metadata. Um, and what I really like about it is you can classify it yourself, you can write in and validate a particular uh, cell of your interest. So after a lot of uh, back and forth, me checking pictures and Juan pe checking pictures, we've so far, and again, keep in mind, we're not in the ideal size fraction, but this is what's publicly available to us at the moment. Uh, we can start to get a, an idea of how abundant these images are of these particular targets in the Tara survey here. We can also, because those images are also tagged with some metadata about the depth distribution, we can start to see that populations are coming out uh, in the deeper depths for this hemialis, whereas we're finding mostly rhizoslenia in, in the upper ocean. But this, again, will, will depend. But we can use this information perhaps to predict what samples to go back in to start looking for more genes related to these symbioses. Uh, we've also come across a few things that we weren't expecting. So we found a couple potential new hosts uh, that appear to have trichomes that look very similar to uh, Rickelia. We found some free living cells, um, but keep these sort of caveats in mind. These samples were collected with a net. They've been manhandled a bit. So uh, are these really free living or did they fall apart? 
And then finally, this is what's kind of exciting, it's hard to see here, but these are different filaments of rhizoslenia, and they appear to have this budding off of that looks really reminiscent to me of an oxyspore, and there seems to be perhaps a trichome inside it. And so it suggests maybe we're identifying a, par a new life stage that has been, never been, it's not known how these populations replicate after sexual reproduction. Now I wanted to come back to how microbes rule the world or why microbes rule the, rule, rule the world. And I didn't really talk about the work we've been doing in terms of evolution, but we have been able to use molecular uh, concatenated phylogenies to try to date the timing of these DDA symbiosis and, and um, when they started to arise and the, and the sequence. And we found that the most internal ones are the oldest ones, the more recent ones are the ones that are external. And if we try to look back in geological time relative to nutrient availability, we can see that this is the time when these symbioses start to arise uh, between 1,500 million years ago. These were also times of lower nutrients than today, and there was also a time when the atmosphere was extremely high in CO2. So perhaps these microbes rule the world because they figure out strategies such as symbioses uh, to persist during adverse conditions. And as we move forward into the future ocean conditions, perhaps the types of symbiosis will change. So just my final comments. Um, I've spent my PhD and my postdoc <laughs> and my current research projects on symbiosis because there's so many unanswered questions. They're one of the least studied populations, I'd say, in the, in the marine environment. Um, and they form these long-term stable partnerships that uh, eventually turned into organelles in the evolutionary past. And so in that sense, they're great systems to study evolution. Uh, they've evaded long-term cultivation, and it highlights the complex nature of them. But what we've been trying to do in my, group, in my group is to not be hindered by this fact, but to find new methods and combinations of methods uh, to really study these systems. And finally, um, I think it's micro in symbiotic research, we often look at what's not there. We see, ah, oh, the genomes are shrinking, they're getting smaller, they're missing this, they're missing that. But I think, actually, I've started to look at this in a different way, what still remains is perhaps more interesting than what has been lost. And it's the same thing, but just a different twist on it. And finally, I need, would not be in Sweden, I would not be here standing today without uh, the Knut and Alice Fallenbrae Foundation. I thank them for, my, for the funding, my department also for sponsoring me. The Swedish Research Council is funding all of this new genetic complementation work. There were members of my lab today that I didn't speak of their research, um, but they've been instrumental in the last five years. Collaborations, field work, and uh, my former colleagues at Max Planck for their nanosims. And with that, I'll take some questions. Thanks. Thank you. Fascinating <laughs> questions. Oh, I stumped everyone. Great. <laughs> Okay, it's the afternoon, I guess. That's no. not an excuse. <laughs> Feek coming. Hmm. One over there. Yeah, that's an ex excellent um, talk. I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, oh, I had a question about the uh, how you feel. If you could comment more on the on the free living. Um, Rickelia, and, and whether you think, because I, I, I found your genetic analyses uh, very compelling, so I was wondering how you, how you think about that problem. Well, um, there is the external symbiont that attaches to Catoceros is alive and well in my lab, <laughs> has been, that was isolated from Station Aloha 2004. Um, the other, uh, based on the, the, the genomes are draft, I must say that as well, they're not closed. But I do think perhaps uh, they do seem to have, based on what we do find in the draft genome, the ability to uh, photosynthesize. They can fix nitrogen, so perhaps they can uh, live freely. But we don't see so many observations of them so far uh, living freely, but the, there's always this insane discrepancy between my qPCR abundances that I use uh, and my microscopy as well. So that sort of begs to me that we have um, more, more either more hosts 
we have free living populations, or there is a fair bit of evidence in heterocystis cytobacteria that at certain and, and cyanobacteria that they go into a ploidic state when they start to die or break down. But I do think there are potentially more free living um, than we than we have um, sampled for. Mm-hmm. Karen. Thank you for a very nice talk again. Um, I was wondering, you hinted something about um, not knowing what happens during reproduction. So I'm wondering, what do you know in terms of recruiting new symbionts, or, or are they all, do you think they are co-growing and co-reproducing? Uh, we know nothing about that, <laughs> but um, I can just make two, maybe a few comments. So. Um, there's, these have been in culture um, for short term by one, a la- Tracy Villarreal in Texas has been successful, and I think John Waterbury as well. Um, and it was always said to me, oh, after so many months, the diatom gets smaller and smaller, and then the culture breaks down, and we have no idea what happens. But there was some really beautiful work done recently at Station Aloha, looking at... Um, the coordination of transcripts between the Rickelia that associate and the Rhizoselenia. Some work done by Sonia Dyerman's group looking at a transcriptome where they were able to pull it out. And they did see some synchronicity in terms of, I think, some, sep- some um, FITC genes such of, of one or the other and some sort of gene that regulates some sort of septal or something, uh, lending evidence that there's some sort of coordination. But when I saw this image that Juan said, I said, this made my day. He, I get, we, we pass images back and forth and I validate. He says, what do you think of this? I said, that just made my day. I think you found the oxyspore. Because we know, I found this old paper of Rhizoslenia in culture uh, explaining how this oxyspore forms. And this was Tracy's theory that it must be passed to the next generation. And, we, and it does look like, and we have now several images like that, that there could be this uh, symbiont going into this little capsule off the side. So it would be really fun to follow up on this. I think these two methodologies, using the microscopy then to go back to the te- to try to find the sample, to pull the, the Rickelia or the host, diatom- host genes out of those massive sequencing efforts. That's sort of the needle in the haystack that I'm trying to resolve. But great question. Thank you. Yeah, Francis. Amazing systems. Uh, (laughs) Somewhat related questions. Um, It's probably too early, but do you know how these organisms are coordinating their activity? So you say that you, you, some people have done RNA-seq transcript profiling. Do you see any kind of signals or small effectors? Yes, so that the research that I was just referencing at Station Aloha, they they were able to show some coordination. Um, it's I should um, back this up a little bit and say that those were whole their environmental samples, and then they're using the symbiont genome to parse away their genes, and then they're using a closely related Rhizoselenia transcriptome to parse potentially rhizoslenia reads out of that RNA seq so it's um, but what they one in, interesting parallel is that they they see a coordination of increased nitrogen fixation genes uh, with carbon fixation genes in the potential host uh, transcriptome and they did see that some sugar if I remember this correctly some of the transporters for uh, in the symbi- transporters for the sugar in the symbiont were coordinated with some of the carbon products of the host. So a little bit, they're ge- we're getting closer. I think the best thing would be if we had the host genome uh, and then we could apply um, or have them in culture and then we could be more easily to tease apart these these cells because they only under bloom conditions does those sort of approaches work. Otherwise, they're t- they're so far less abundant than these larger than these smaller prochlorococcus cells. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyone else? Okay. 
Well then, uh, thanks a lot for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you.